Hi guys, Granger here and welcome to another one of our videos. Opus 7 has recently released and today's video will be talking about the last main element of Opus 7, the water element. So let's get started with our set review. The first card we'll be talking about is Agrius. It is a 6 cost forward at 7,000 power. It is a knight. If you control 7 more characters, Agrius gains plus 2,000 power. When Agrius enters the field, turn over one card at a time from the top of your deck until a character of cost 3 or less is revealed. Play it onto the field, then shuffle the other cards revealed and return them to the bottom of your deck. So first of all, a couple of things in regards to this card. So, if you reveal a character card that's free or less, and you cannot play it onto the field, whether it's because you control a character of that name already, or because you have too many backups on the field, then this effect fizzles out. Basically, all those cards get shuffled up and then get placed on the bottom of your deck. If you reveal a character card that you cannot put onto the field, then effectively this card's effect just like doesn't do anything and you've overpaid for a 7,000 power forward. But if you do put a card onto the field, then it's actually not terrible value. This card can effectively become a 1 CP forward if you consider the fact that you are getting a character of cost 3 or less put onto the field. So it's actually pretty valuable if you consider it in that regard. So this card is a lot like Sid Previa in that it's a 6 cost card that allows you to play a 3 cost onto the field for free. But compared to Sid Previa, this effect is much, much more random and there's a potential for you to play this card and for nothing to happen whatsoever. So in order to play Agrius, you definitely need to build your deck in a way that you can maximize your chances with this card. Now there are two schools of thought for playing Agrius. You either build your deck with a large variety of cards that cost three or less, so there's a very small likelihood of you revealing a card that you can't put onto the field. The other alternative way to play this card is if you build your deck in a way that there are only a few cards that cost three or less. And those are very specific cards that you want for your deck. So for example, if you wanted to ensure that you always have a game with Ophelia, you might build a deck where Ophelia is your only card that costs three or less, and every card is a four cost or higher. So that every time you play Agrius, you're guaranteed to get that Ophelia and put it onto the field. So obviously there are some very interesting ways in which you can use this card if this is the case. It's not immediately clear what applications of this card there are, but the fact that its effect is so powerful means it's, it's always going to be a card that you have to consider in future when you're building a deck, and if there's any specific card that you need to have every single game. That being said though, if you just play a whole bunch of cards that are quite cheap, and you play Agrius as a way to get value, then actually it's not a bad card, and it synergizes with its first ability a much better. So the first ability of making a 9000 power forward if you control 7 more characters is actually quite good considering its value. So if you build your deck where all the cards at a lower cost, a large majority of them are standard units, then it's very easy to play Agrius for large value for a majority of the time. That being said though, you definitely do have to build your deck in a very specific way to take advantage of Agrius. This is not as easy a card to build around as any other deck. Even though this card is a knight, unfortunately, this card is most likely not going to see play in any sort of knight decks. Typically, knight decks play cards that are very specific knights, and they have very specific backups, so there's a very large likelihood of you hitting a card that you already have on the field if you play Agrius in a knight deck. Therefore, I do not recommend it. But, water already has a lot of very good standard units, and if you pair it up with another element that also has pretty good standard units, such as a wind, you get to build a deck with a high value play every time you play Agrius. Whether you get a 2 CP back for free, or whether you get a 2 or 3 CP forward to put onto the field for free, anytime in that situation where you can successfully resolve Agrius, then you're getting a lot of value. So potentially as this metagame develops more and more, we might see some water decks start trying this card and seeing what they can do with it. But definitely this is a card that's got a lot of potential for power, but we haven't quite figured out the intricacies of this card or how to best use it and manage its risk. So this is definitely a card to look out for the future as more creative deck builders start refining their lists and start finding users to use this card. The next card we'll be talking about is Gawain. He is a free cost forward at 7,000 power. He is a knight and his ability is Gawain does not receive any damage from Ford's abilities. So this definitely seems like a weaker, although slightly less conditional version of Beatrix. So Beatrix has a very similar ability, except her ability is only active when Steiner is on the field. So comparing Beatrix and Gawain, Beatrix's ability doesn't allow her to receive any damage from any ability, whereas Gawain only prevents damage dealt to him from Ford's abilities. In addition to this, Beatrix also has the ability to reduce opponents' Ford's powers when she attacks, Gawain doesn't have that ability at all. So ultimately, Gawain just seems like a lackluster knight to put into your Water X knight deck. So any sort of situation where you are putting Gawain into your deck, you're doing it strictly because you need to fill more knight numbers in your deck. That being said though, if you do want to play Mono Water Knights, this card actually might push that threshold up to a more relevant number now. So between a card like Waka and Ophelia, Gawain can potentially be a free CP 9k forward that also doesn't receive any damage from forwards. Ultimately, that being said though, you probably don't want to run this guy more than one or two copies in your deck because Beatrix is just going to be largely better in a large majority of situations. So because of this, unless you're really struggling to put water forwards into your deck that are knights, I would not play Gawain in nearly any situation. Next card is Kamari. This is a 6 house forward at 9,000 power. He is a job title guardian. 
and his ability is cost required to play Kamari onto the field is reduced by one for each job guardian you control. The job guardians other than Kamari you control cannot be chosen by your opponent's abilities, and category X characters other than Kamari you control cannot be chosen by your opponent's summons. So immediately, this is a card that everyone looked at as the head of the guardians deck. Basically, there are no other cards that really reward you for playing a lot of guardians in your deck. Do note his first ability reduces cost for each guardian you control, not necessarily guardian forwards you control. So this does include your backups as well, and does mean he can reduce his cost if you play a card like Lulu, or you put a card like the new walker onto your field. While people value this card less because of his protection ability does not protect himself, if you think about how cheap you can potentially get this forward, I think that definitely should override people's judgment on this card. So if you just have two Guardians on the field, he becomes a 4 CP 9k, which is reasonable value by itself. However, if you add a single Guardian onto the field, whether it's going to be Jek, whether it's going to be Tidus, or whether it's going to be Auron, then all of a sudden Kamari's cost becomes a 3 CP 9k, and that's pretty good value. And he brings a really good blanket protection effect. So when you consider how cheap you can get this forward out, he's actually pretty good value, even though he doesn't protect himself. So continuing on that, when you do have him on the field, all your other guardians cannot be chosen by summons or abilities. Not only this though, but if you have other Final Fantasy X characters, they can't be chosen by your opponent's summons. So if you do happen to play some other Final Fantasy X characters, such as, let's say, Two Cost Yuna, she's immune to summons while you have Kamari on the field. So that's a relevant aspect to him, in that he does provide protection to your FF10 characters. Now this card actually becomes pretty relevant if you play it with Opus 1 Legendary Tidus. Now this Opus 1 Legendary Tidus has the ability called Blitz Ace, which allows him to attack as many times during that same turn as damage that you've received. So generally this is a very powerful effect, but if you receive a EX Burst ability, generally that's going to stop Tidus straight away. Now Kamari is a great complement to this card in that when you have Kamari on the field, yes Kamari can still be chosen by your opponent's summons and abilities, but while you have him on the field, your Tidus is completely protected from choosing summons and abilities, which include EX Burst as well. And considering how that Tidus is also a Guardian, it synergizes well into the Guardian archetype. So while people say that Kamari is expensive and he doesn't protect himself, overall I think that this is a very solid card if you consider the fact that you're getting him cheap and you're giving protection to all your other Guardians. Not only that, but a lot of the other Guardians also synergize pretty well. So if you've got Auron, it gives you guys Brave, and Tidus does have his Blitz Ace as potential, and Jekt is a cheap forward as well, that's a Guardian. So overall, I think people are underrating this card, and definitely I think Guardians is a pretty playable strategy, although people haven't really sort of started tinkering around with these lists just yet. But definitely as some of us more experienced deck builders come back from the World Championships, there'll be a lot more content for you guys to see as we break down how to build a Guardian deck and what we think is the most optimal list. Next card we'll be talking about is Chemist. It is a 2 CP backup for Water Water Dull, choose one forward, activate it. So this is a recategorization of Astrologian that we received in Opus 2. So it's got the exact same ability except it's been changed to Final Fantasy V, which means it does synergize with Bards and Faris. Faris being a water card right now. Astrologian is definitely a relevant water backup and has been seeing some play recently and has seen a lot of play in the past. So definitely if you're playing Faris, which is a relevant card if you're playing Lena, so Chemist seems to be a very easy switch over from Astrologian. So at the cost of having slightly sexier artwork, you have the ability to pick this card up from Faris when you play it onto the field. So overall, this is a very relevant upgrade from the previous card because of its category change. Next card is Sahajin. It is a two cost monster and it is water's discard monster this time. So first ability is put Sahajin into a break zone, choose up the two forwards you control, activate them, they gain plus 1000 power until the end of the turn. And it's discard abilities, choose one forward of cost one, return it to its owner's hand. You can only use this ability if Sahajin is in your hand. So his first ability is a lot like a wind summon called Sylph, which allows you to reactivate one guy and gives all your guys plus 1000 power. In this case, Sahajin allows you to reactivate two guys and give them both plus 1000 power. The plus 1000 power isn't a huge combat buff, but it is a relevant buff nonetheless. The ability to reactivate two forwards is generally what you're paying this effect for. Having a way to just break a monster on the field to reactivate two of your forwards is actually very, very good. And the fact that being a two cost water monster means that it can be returned with Gao. So it's a particularly easy monster for water to play with. As for its discard ability, as we said before in a previous video, pretty much the only relevant one cost forward that's seeing play at the current moment is Leo. So in the very specific situation where you have Sakajin, you can discard Sakajin to return your opponent's Leo back to hand. But more importantly, you can also do it to return your own Leo to the hand. Earth Water is definitely a deck that has been played because there are cards like Viking and Leela that combo with Leo very well. And so towards the mid to late game, Leo will generally be like 9 or 10 or 11k power because you have so many forwards on the field. So in those very specific situations where your opponent uses some sort of like board wiping ability or use some sort of way to destroy your Leo, you always have the ability to discard a Sakajin from your hand to return your own Leo back to your hand so you can play it again on the next turn. So while this is a very specific use for Sakajin, 
it does mean that it is a relevant and playable card in the current metagame. Both its breakability and its discard ability are both potentially usable in the game right now. But when you consider how water has ways to bring it back very cheaply, then this card's playability increases a lot in the water deck. So definitely if you try this in your water deck, you're probably not going wrong. But outside of water, I don't think this will see much play. The next card we'll be talking about is Geoskano. It's a two cost monster. That's one of the transforming monsters of this set. When a forward opponent controls returns to its owner's hand from the field, Geoskano also becomes a forward with 7,000 power. And if Geoskano receives damage, the damage is reduced by 1,000 instead. This ability does not end at the end of turn. This ability will not trigger if Geos Gano is a forward. So first of all, this is not a easy ability to trigger off, simply because returning forwards is generally pretty weak in the current meta game. A large amount of forwards that are being played all have enter play abilities. So you using an ability or a summon to return one of your opponent's forwards back to hand is generally not a cost effective strategy for you to use. So definitely Geos Gano has a lot of options to trigger off its ability, but there's not going to be too many situations where your opponent has forwards on the field that you want to proactively spend resources to return. That being said though, when you do trigger off its ability and transform it into a forward, it is a somewhat underwhelming forward. A two CP 7K is the same base stats that most of the other forwards are at, but its ability to reduce its damage by a thousand kind of seems underwhelming. If you compare it to a card like Hagnazo that reduces the damage it receives by 4,000 per packet, it means that Hagnazo can tank up a lot of damage, especially if they come in multiple waves. Being able to reduce damage by a thousand is very, very marginal. It just means occasionally when it fights a 7,000 power forward, it won't die. But other than this, it doesn't really increase its survivability by all that much. Yes, it is a two CP water monster as well, which means you can return it with a card like Gao. But other than this, there are really no other reasons for you to play Geos Gano. It's just another forward that you can put on the field. And here's the thing, Lena and Gao fundamentally are very similar cards. They're both five cost cards that bring back a two cost card from your break zone and puts it onto the field. So Lena sees a lot of play because it can bring back Knights and Fame Mimic Gogos. And Knights are generally around seven or 8K around this time of the game. That being said though, Gao can pull out Geos Gano, but then you have to use a bounce effect in order to trigger off his ability to transform into a forward. So ultimately, it's very difficult to find a scenario where you would want to play Geos Gainer as opposed to a two cost forward in the form of Knight in a water deck. So because of the lack of the payoff and the difficulty of triggering off its ability, this card probably won't see any play. The next card we'll be talking about is White Mage. It is a free cost forward at 6,000 power. Its ability is when White Mage enters the field, choose up the two forwards you control, activate them. So this card is a little bit underwhelming for what it does as well. So at a free CP 6k forward, it is under the curve, even though it does get to reactivate your forwards. Being a 6k forward is a little bit underpowered right now, though. It doesn't really fight against a lot of the metagame. A lot of forwards that you want to have to be able to contest the board will be 7k forwards. And being a base 6k is just a little bit too weak. If you pay just one CP extra, you get access to Porum, which is a 4 CP 7k that reactivates all your forwards you control, as well as having an interesting S ability. Alternatively, if you play Tidus, you get effectively the same thing, but you also get the benefit of back attack. So Tidus is a free cost forward at 7,000 power. So it's a little bit bigger than White Mage and it can be used to reactivate all your water forwards. So White Mage overall is just not a particularly strong card and there doesn't seem to be much reason to play it. The next card we'll be talking about is Styx. It is a five CP forward at 8,000 power. When Styx enters the field, choose one forward and opponent controls. If the cost of play Styx was only paid with water CP, return it to its owner's hand. And its special ability Undying Cry is S water water dull. Until the end of turn, all forwards and opponent controls lose 5,000 power. You can only use this ability if you have received five points of damage or more. So in this set, there are the four generals and they all reward you for paying their cost with a specific type of CP. So in Styx's case, you've got to pay it all with water. So it definitely sits in a mono water type strategy. So when you consider that effectively you're getting a Leviathan attached to this card, then its value is not too terrible at a five CP 8,000 power four. But the big benefit of having just Leviathan is that they are good EX bursts. They are EX bursts. So there will be scenarios where you do get to bounce one of your opponent's forwards for free. However, Styx doesn't offer you that benefit. So really with Styx, you're not getting as much benefit or as much cost effectiveness as you think. Alternatively, if you do want to play like bounce type effects, there are certain cards like Strago that are more cost effective for clearing out your opponent's board so you can attack through. So ultimately you don't really need to go up to five CP to play Styx in order to create openings in your opponent's board. In addition to this, the five CP mark is really hotly contested in water. Water Aura has a really powerful five CP forward in the form of Lena and also, into, um, and also potentially in Gao. Styx just finds it very difficult to really compare against up to those existing cards. And because of how it contests the 5 CP slot, this card is very difficult to put into your decks. As for its S ability, it doesn't offer anything too amazing. So yes, you get to reduce your opponent's force by 5,000 power, which is generally about how much power reduction you can expect a Kagnazo to be doing towards that part of the game. But the issue is, is that Styx has to both pay two water, S and Dull, but 
also you can only use it if you have five or more damage at the time which is the biggest restriction of this card overall. So definitely it seems like this card doesn't really hold up compared to what Water is offering, and considering its effect is generally much easier to achieve using other cards, and is generally more cost affecting using other cards as well. The next card we'll be talking about is Sarah FFL. She's a seven cost backup. She's a Warrior of Light. When Sarah FFL enters the field, you may search for one job Warrior of Light forward of cost four or less other than Light and Dark, and play it onto the field. So as a seven CP forward, this is actually reasonably good value considering you are getting a four CP forward and putting it onto field. So it effectively does make this a one CP backup in that regard. Unfortunately, the fact that it is a seven CP backup means that it's really expensive to put into play. Even though you are getting reasonable value out of it, if you play it any time in the mid game, you are discarding a lot of cards in order to put it into play. Although that being said though, it does allow you to find the very specific warrior light that you would need in that very specific instance. Generally at the moment, the best two targets would seem to be Wall and to be Aegis. Both of them are 4 CP AKs and they both have very relevant ability when they come into play. So Sarah FFL, while it's expensive, is probably justifiable to play one or two copies in your deck because of its ability to search for specifically what you need and to put it onto the field without any sort of elemental requirements of the card that you're searching and putting into play. So potentially if you are playing say a Fire, Water, Warrior of Light list, you can potentially play one or two copies of this Sarah to allow you to search your deck and put a Earth Wall into play if you need to. Or alternatively, there might be other uses for this card as well. Maybe if you're playing Water Wind and you want to put the Wind Warrior of Light Bart into play, you can do that and then you can trigger off his abilities from there. So this card, whilst being expensive, there are actually some very nice targets that you can put onto the field with it. So as a result, this card is not a bad card. But obviously you have to build a very specific archetype in order to make use out of this card. But in the decks where you do want to play this card, it's actually pretty solid for what it does. So definitely it's worth trying one or two copies if you want to build a Warrior of Light deck, which is definitely one of those archetypes I can foresee a lot of people trying out this set. Talking about Warriors of Light, the next card we'll be talking about is Dusk. It is a free CP forward at 6,000 power. When Dusk enters the field, if you control a job Warrior of Light forward other than Dusk, draw a card. Dull, during this turn, the cost required to cast your next summon is reduced by one, it cannot become zero. So when you consider the card that this card picks up, it effectively becomes a 1 CP 6000 power forward, which is above curve and is pretty good value. So besides from just playing this while you have a Warrior of Light on the field, this is also a card that you can put back on the field if your Light Wall dies, because it does allow you to play a Warrior Light from your Break Zone onto the field when it dies, and potentially you can play Dusk from the Break Zone and to draw a card as well. So obviously his ability to draw a card is pretty good value. As for his ability to dull himself to reduce the cost of a summon, there's some interesting applications to this. If you combine it with say the Earth Wall, you can give this forward Brave, you can attack with it, and then subsequently later on during the turn, you can then dull it to reduce the cost of your summons. So if you were to play a Earth Water Warrior of Light deck, imagine attacking with this guy with Brave, dulling it and then getting to play a Hecaton Care for one less, right? So you get to play a two cost Hecaton for one CP or play a three cost Hecaton for just two CP, which makes it much, much more easier to cast. So overall, this card is just like a straight value card. You play it down, you get a card, that's absolutely fine. And then on a couple of situations where you may not be able to attack with him because your opponent might have a larger blocker, using his ability to straight up reduce the cost of a summon is pretty handy as well because if you're not attacking through with Dusk, it means your opponent's probably got a big guy. And if your opponent's got a big guy, you're probably going to use the summon to try to blow it up. And having Dusk to reduce the cost is pretty good. So overall, while this card doesn't immediately jump out as being like a super powerful card, I think that its ability and its effect is very good for what it does in the deck. And definitely if I'm building a Warrior Light deck, very much so I'll be playing it with water. And I think Dusk jumps into that combination very well. Next, we'll be talking about Titus, one of the water legendaries of the set. So he is a free CP 7000 power forward, so he's on curve. And he's got some very interesting special abilities. So first of all, he is a Guardian. So he does fit into the Guardian archetype. His ability is Back Attack, which means that he can't be played any time when you could play a Summon or an ability, which means that you can play during your opponent's turn. You can only pay with CP produced by Water Backups to play Titus from your hand onto the field. When Titus enters the field, select one of the two following actions. Activate all Water Forwards, or choose one Water Forward that gains plus 2,000 power until the end of the turn. So overall, looking at this card, it seems a little bit underwhelming for what it does. So yes, it is a free CP 7k forward that you can play during any time. However, the big restriction of you having to play it using your water backups is pretty restrictive. It means that you have to keep a lot of backups open. And in certain situations, your opponent may expect to see Titus coming out, especially when you leave free water backups open. So as for his interplay abilities, yes, being able to activate your water forwards is a reasonably solid ability, but does it really justify the fact that you have to keep free water CP open in order to do it? Even with the back attack ability, it does seem a little bit underwhelming. As for his second ability, it's not even as good as say like Leviathan as a summon because it doesn't even give all your water forts plus 2000 power. It just gives only one guy plus 2000 power. So even as just like a straight buff, it can only buff a water forward and it only buffs them 
for 2,000 power. So as a legendary card, this card definitely seems underwhelming. Even the most optimal situations, it doesn't feel like you're getting a lot of value or a lot of powerful plays or tempo swings with it. So overall, in my opinion, this card just seems a little bit cumbersome and doesn't really seem as good as being a legend type card really should be. That being said though, it's not a bad card. So definitely you can still play it in your water deck if you want to, and it's not a terrible card to be played in there, but it just feels like you can get much better value if you were to play playing other cards in your water deck, in my opinion. Moving on to the next card, we have yet another Tidus. It is a 4 CP forward at 9,000 power, so it's a little bit above the curve. Its job is also a Guardian. Its ability is, when Tidus enters the field, choose one character you control, return it to its owner's hand. Interestingly and ironically, this seems like a much, much more useful and interesting ability than the previous Tidus that we had before. On one hand, you can review his ability to return a character you control back to your hand as a drawback to pay for the fact that he is a 4 CP 9k. So that is one way to consider it. Even though it is technically a drawback, it is relevant and useful in a lot of situations. Any situation where you want to replay a card, whether it's a forward or a backup, you can always use Tidus to recur it. So you can always use Tidus as a way to put it back into your hand. And at the same time, you've just put down a really strong powerful forward at the same time. So obviously this has applications in the Guardian deck, whether you want to pick up a card like Ject, or whether you want to pick up a card like Lulu. These are both applications for you to play Tidus and to pick up one of these powerful cards and put it down again. Not only in the Guardian deck, but Tidus is also relevant in just any deck that he can be put into. If you're talking about just strictly mono water, the fact that you can pick up a Layla or a Viking with Tidus ability is really strong. So obviously if you've seen any water players right now, they're all playing Layla Vikings because it's just such a strong combination of cards. So obviously Tidus being able to pair up with Layla or being able to pick up a Viking, especially the free cost Viking, which draws your card when it leaves play, you can get a whole lot of value from this Tidus. And if you move out of strictly water, there are a ton of good effects and a ton of cards from a whole bunch of different elements that you can combine with Tidus to reuse their abilities quite well. Water had played Scholar for such a long time as a backup, but potentially we might see them transition away from that and use other backups in their backup slots. And potentially we might see this card as a playable alternative for Scholar if you do want to recur or return certain forwards back to your hand. So ironically, this Tidus seems like a much more playable, useful Tidus than the previous Tidus even though it's just common, and it's got this nice, cool, gimmicky artwork as well. So overall, I like this card, and I feel that in terms of just like everyday standard use, this Tidus is much, much more flexible and has a lot of great applications right now. The next card we'll be talking about is Ninja. It is a 2 CP forward at 5,000 power, standard unit, of course. When Ninja enters the field, choose one forward and opponent controls. If the cost paid to play Ninja included 5 CP, it cannot block this turn. Also, it's got Water Dull, Return Ninja to your hand. So this forward kind of has a built-in Red Mage effect on it. So definitely Red Mage is a very powerful ability and it's common in a lot of fire decks because it just makes it very difficult to block against fire decks. So being attached to Ninja, it's actually giving you pretty good value in that playing Red Mage would require you to spend 3 CP, whereas Ninja in this case, you only require 2 CP in order to trigger off its ability. Not only this, but Ninja also has a way to return itself back to your hand. So if you do want to use this ability again, you definitely have the ability to return it to your hand and then play it again from your hand. So definitely it's a little bit more cumbersome to use Ninja's effect again and again, but it is a forward and also it doesn't necessarily have to hog up a backup slot in your deck. Not only this, but if you do have access to fire, you do have access to a lot of fire's abilities that do promote you or incentivize you to play more two cost forwards, such as Godot that does increase their power as well. So overall, this card is not bad for what it does. And considering the elements involved, it is actually not a bad card to be playing in this archetype. Unfortunately, the big restriction of this card is that you have to have paid its CP in order to put it into play, in order for you to trigger off this ability. So it does not combo well with Phoenix, which is one of Fire's favorite and more interesting summons in the game. So overall, this card is not a bad card. It's a playable card, but it's very difficult to find a scenario where you would want to play it right now in the current metagame over existing water two cost forwards, such as Knight, such as Ephemeral Summoner, or such as Fame and McGogo. Next card we'll be talking about is Halicarnassus. And this is a card that a lot of water players are excited for. It's a free CP 7k forward, so it's on curve. When Halakarnassus enters the field, all forwards and opponent controls lose their abilities until the end of turn. Dull, discard two summons, choose one forward, break it. So both of these abilities on this forward is actually really great. So the fact that you can just turn off your opponent's forward's abilities for the turn, it's actually really powerful. So whether your opponent's forwards have some sort of combat ability on them, or whether your opponent's forwards have some sort of ability where they can't be chosen by summons or abilities, Halakarnassus can wipe those effects away, allowing your cards to deal with them. As for its second ability, it's also really relevant in water as well, because water tends to be one of those elements that plays a lot of summons, and quite a few of those summons tend to be bounce type effects. Very few of the water summons can permanently get rid of a forward on the field, which is really annoying because sometimes water might want to remove a forward from the field, but 
bouncing them is not a permanent solution. So Halicon Access actually allows you to convert those summons into ways to break forwards, which is something that Water generally struggles very much to do. So if you're playing a Water deck and you happen to have extra copies of Leviathan or Choo Choo Lane or Poo Poo even in your hand, you can pitch two of them to destroy one of your opponent's forwards by just using a dull ability. So overall, it's generally pretty well costed. You are effectively spending four CP in order to do this ability, but then again, a lot of summons at around the 4 CP mark are generally about how much you would spend to destroy a forward anyways. So having that as a dull ability on a forward is actually very solid in my opinion. So Halicon Access is a great card. You play it for immediate value. And then if she does stay alive, occasionally you can recycle cards that aren't so relevant for you or aren't so useful for you at the time that generally water plays a lot of for an additional break ability, which is pretty unconditional and it's definitely something that water needs. So overall, this card is a great card. And if you're playing water, then I definitely recommend you trying this out to see how good this card is. The next card we'll be talking about is Faris. It is a four CP forward at 6,000 power. Its job is Warrior of Light. It's category five. And if you control a card named Lena, Faris gains plus 2,000 power. When Faris enters the field, reveal top five cards of your deck, add one category five character among them to your hand and return the others to the bottom of your deck in any order. So it's great to see that we finally have another Faris being released in the game. And this time Faris has been element changed from fire over to water. Now this actually works really perfectly with Lena because now both Faris and Lena are both in the water element. So when you consider having Lena on the field and you getting a card from Faris' ability, Faris is potentially a two CP AK on the field, which is super good value. But not only this, Faris' ability to look at top 5 cards and put a category 5 into your hand actually has a lot of targets. So of course Lena is a target, but not only that, two common targets for Lena are also category 5. Knight, which is the main target for Lena, is category 5, as well as Fame Mimic Gogo. -Go. So when you consider how well this pairs up, in that Faris searches for Lena and the two targets that Lena wants to play the most, then Faris is actually really, really powerful and super good value for what it does and fits into the archetype so perfectly. Not only this, it also is a Job Warrior of Light. So if you happen to be playing your mono water deck with, say, the Light Warrior deck from Opus 2, then this Faris becomes potentially an 8k forward at 2 CP that also reduces damage as well, similar to Warrior of Light. So this card just ticks a lot of boxes. All of its effects have good targets and it synergizes with the cards that it's forced to be played with. So definitely if you are playing a more standard water build, I would definitely recommend you try Faris if you have the space in your deck to put him in there. He's just such a good value card and helps make certain aspects of the water engine very consistent. The next card we'll be talking about is Braska. It is a free CP backup. The cost required to play your job summoner onto the field is reduced by one. It cannot become zero. So this card is a pretty overpriced card considering what it does. Definitely I could see it's free CP backup costs being relevant if it played a more relevant job. But the fact that it only reduces the cost of summoners is actually really restrictive because there are currently very few summoners in the game. So if you were to just use him to reduce the cost of your summoner backups, let's say a Yuna and an Ico, you've effectively paid free CP for a backup that's reduced the cost of two of your backups by one CP each. So overall, this card wasn't really a relevant investment or a useful investment to reduce the cost of two of your backups. Therefore, the most relevant use for Braska is to reduce the cost of your summoner forwards. And right now there exists only three forwards that have the summoner job. And they are Yuna, although there are a couple of Yunas, Yuna Leska, which is bad, and Rydia. These are the only three summoner forwards in the game. So definitely you do get much more value if you are playing the summoner forwards, because as a forward dies, you get to play another copy of again, and you get to take advantage of the cost reduction again. That being said though, only Light Yuna is really seeing any sort of competitive play at the moment, and Light Yuna is really not even that good even at the moment. So even considering the fact that Light Yuna, you may play her multiple times during the game, having Brask on the field really doesn't make a huge difference in the game. Potentially reducing Rydia from a free cost forward to a two cost forward might be relevant or useful, but it seems like the payoff is just not good enough considering you have to put a free cost back up onto the field in order to do so. But ultimately, whilst the number of summoners in the game are limited, Braska's effect becomes even more limited. So because of all these considerations, Braska won't see any play, but it's definitely a card that we may look back into in the future as we see more summoners join the game. The next card we'll be talking about is Mime. It is a 4 CP forward at 8,000 power. It's a standard unit. When Mime enters the field, if the cost paid to play Mime included Earth CP, all forwards you control gain plus 2,000 power until the end of turn. So this is effectively just a poor man's Gipol. Gipol is the same stats, same cost, and it gives you twice as much power. Not only that, but Gipol is also an EX burst as well. So literally, the only reason why you would ever play Mime onto the field is if you've already got a Gipol on the field and you can't play another Gipol on the field. Besides from that specific one interaction, Gipo is better in any other case. So unless the fact that it's a standard unit is super important to you, I would run Gipo in any sort of situation 
where I would want to put this mime in. So because of that, I don't think this card will ever see any play at all. The next card we'll be looking at is Yagrosh. It is a 1 CP backup, and we see very few of these in the game. He is a job Psychom, and his ability is when Yagrosh enters the field, choose one backup other than Yagrosh you control, return it to its owner's hand. So obviously the relevant application for this card is that it allows you to return backups back to your hand so you can play them again. The most relevant application for this card is Shantoto, and here's the crazy thing. You don't even need to play water in your deck to reuse Shantoto. Since Shantoto can create elements of any CP, as long as you have a Shantoto on the field, you can just always tap Shantoto to put Yagrosh into play and then use Yagrosh to pick Shantoto up. So there is potential for just Earth decks to just play one or two copies of this card, pitch them when they're not useful, and in those few situations where you want to play Shantoto again, you can just put this Yagrosh down, bang, you get another Shantoto on the field. So that's just like immediate uses for this card. But another interesting component about this card is that it is Job Psychom, which means it does synergize with the Jilnabat release from this set. So these are the only two cards in the game that have Job Psychom. So whilst you have Jialg Rush on the field, when Jilnabat enters the field, your opponent discards two cards from their hand. And for a 4 CP backup, that's actually pretty good value. But not to mention that, if you happen to have Jilnabat on the field already, you can always use Yag Rush to return Jilnabat back to your hand and then play it again. So this Yag Rush has a very specific use in a couple of different situations. And outside that, it's a very cheap and efficient way for you to reuse backups. Whilst this card, I don't think we'll see much play in Mono Water, simply because Mono Water happens to have a lot of backups that have a lot of solid ongoing effects. But in other elements that do want to recur certain backups, if you have a splash of water in there, or if you have a way to create water CP, then definitely Yagrosh seems like a fantastic way and very efficient way to pick up those backups to use again in future. So definitely do keep this card in mind if you are building decks and there are certain very powerful backups that you want to be able to reuse again in the game. The next card we'll be talking about is Oracle. It is a 2 CP backup. When Oracle enters the field, look at the top two cards of your deck, return these to the top or bottom of your deck in any order. So first thing to note in regards to this card, you can put one card at the top and at the bottom. So that is something that has been ruled as an application of this card. So technically this is a 2 CP backup that's not technically getting you any card advantage, but there are a lot of ways to take advantage of the information that you have and also the ability to rearrange these cards however you like. At the very least, if you play this, you can always look at the top two cards of your deck and determine what you would like to draw on your following turn or just plan what you're going to draw on the following turn. So if you look at the top two cards of your deck and the cards that you don't want to draw on the following turn, great, just put them on the bottom of your deck and you're set, right? But any sort of situation where you are playing cards that need to reveal the top card of your deck or you need to guess certain aspects of the top card of your deck, then Oracle does give you that information up front if you're playing just mono water. So whether you're playing a card like Schrodinger or whether you're playing a card like Agrius or whether you're playing a card like Vesoya, these are all ways for you to have a look at the top card of your deck and to get some sort of value out of it whilst just playing a 2 CP backup. So for what it does, it's actually pretty solid. And also there are certain degrees of mind games to this card as well, right? So if your opponent's got a forward on the field and they're going to and you think they're going to attack you, you can put an Oracle down on your turn, look at the top two cards of your deck, and specifically just keep one on top of the deck, right? From your opponent's perspective, it might look like you looked at the top two cards of your deck and just kept one of the EX bursts at the top of your deck, right? So there is a degree of sort of like mind gaminess to Oracle as well, right? So your opponent may not attack you, even though it's not even guaranteed that you put an EX burst on the top of your deck. So definitely with this card, there are interesting aspects and components to this card at various different levels. Even at just the most bottom level, being able to look at the top two cards of your deck and to rearrange your deck gives you a lot of value in terms of how you want to set up your following plays. At even higher levels, it allows you to use this card as a combo with cards like Vesoya or other methods like Schrodinger. And at the highest level, you can even use it as a way to mind game your opponent. So when you take into consideration all these uses of this card, this card is actually a pretty strong card. And the only thing that's really holding this card back is the competition of how good the other water backups you are playing are. The next card we'll be talking about is Leviathan. It is a four CP summon, EX burst, choose one forward of cost four or less, return it to its owner's hand. If Leviathan results from an EX burst, return it to its owner's hand and draw one card instead. So this is more expensive and it has a smaller range than the typical Leviathan that we've seen before in the past. But if you do hit it as an EX burst, you do get to draw a card. So we have seen some recent decks use this in mono water with Fasoya. So obviously for Soya, it just combines with a lot of water summons very well because nearly all of them are EX bursts and you have Ephemeral Summoner, which allows you to put these EX bursts summons at the top of your deck. So obviously the drawback of this card is much, much more mitigated in water than any other element simply because you have access to Ephemeral Summoner. And obviously this being combined with Fasoya means that you're going to get advantage of being able to draw a card. Whereas water typically use other summons in the past to combine with Fasoya, Leviathan actually has a really strong tempo play. So when you do use Fasoya, you can deal 7,000 damage to afford to kill it, and then you can return another one of your points forwards. And on top of that, you get to draw a card. So this is 
definitely one of the most relevant summons of this set simply because it combos really well into the existing water archetype. Not only that, but another new card that has been released in the set in the form of Halicarnassus, that card also combines really well with this card. If you do happen to have this Leviathan in your hand, you can obviously just pitch it for CP, but if you have a Halicarnassus on the field, you can always use Halicarnassus' ability to just pitch this at another summon in your hand that you might not be using just to break one of your opponent's forwards, which is generally very difficult for water to do. And it's great to see that they have an ability like this now in the game. So overall, this card is not a great card, but the only reason why it's being played is because it fits in so well to the existing archetype and it fits in very well into the existing water strategies. So as a result, this card is seeing play and it definitely is one of those cards that you want to play if you're playing this specific mono water type of list. And the final water card of the set is Waka. It is a 2 CP backup. Its job is Guardian. Its ability is Dull. Choose one category 10 forward you control it again. It's plus 1000 power until the end of turn. So the only reason why you want to play this is in two decks. So one, because it is a Guardian backup, you want to play it in the Fire Water Guardians deck. That way you can buff up your Final Fantasy 10 characters and you're able to reduce the cost of your Kamari. Another deck that may want to play this is the Gold Wings deck or any sort of Yuna Riku Pain type deck. Being in Wind, the Gold Wings don't have access to a free CP backup that can increase all their powers by 1000 power like Waka does. So having this two cost Waka allows you to give these forwards plus 1000 power by just dulling it. The biggest drawback of this card, however, is that it does clash with the Opus 1 Waka, which is the water's equivalent way to increase all their water forwards by plus 1000 power. So obviously this card won't see any play in any sort of mono water deck, because strictly the free cost Waka is just better in all these circumstances if you're playing just mono water. But if you're playing Fire Water Guardians or potentially Gold Wings, and considering how Gold Wings sometimes uses water, this is not a bad card to add into it. So definitely this is a very solid card. Unfortunately, the big restriction of this card is that it is named Waka, but in those very specific situations where you're building a deck that does include water and doesn't have enough water forwards to justify playing the other Waka, this is not a bad play if you are playing category 10 forwards as well. So guys, what do you think? Were there any cards that are overrated or underrated? What cards do you think that I might have missed something out on or what cards do you think that I might have judged a little bit too harshly. Do let me know your thoughts and opinions in the description below. If you have any cool ideas, do feel free to share them as well. I do love hearing feedback from you guys. If you guys enjoyed this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. I'll be putting out a whole much more content about the Final Fantasy TCG in the near future. I hope you guys enjoyed. Until next time, Grand J out.